Good morning, beautiful children of God. Amen, amen. This morning I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. The word of the Lord says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, church, how we await that glorious day when we will see the glory that the Father has bestowed upon his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In, verse, in the first verse of this chapter, the Apostle mentions the following forms of grace that are found in Christ, which Christ has made available to his church. Firstly, the grace of consolation, which means being able to stand beside someone with words of affirmation, words that lift up, words that comfort, words that make others feel not alone. Then there is the grace of comfort that comes from Christ's love, which enables us to comfort and sympathize and understand one another in a loving manner. Also mentioned is the grace of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This fellowship is in communion with God and with fellow Christians. Finally, we have the grace of affection and mercy, which enables us to be compassionate and tender-hearted towards one another. Beloved ones of God, let us not be self-absorbed with our own lives, our own problems, our own ambitions, etc., but rather let us be sensitive to the needs and concerns of others, mutually cherishing harmony among ourselves. Finally, brethren, in verse 5, reminds us of how Christ, it is important to have a Christ-like mindset. When we believed in Christ, God implanted his mind into ours and we became a new creation. However, to, continue, to continually have this mindset and act like Christ, we need to read the Bible daily. We need to listen to praise and worship music, fellowship with other Christians who encourage us in our walk with the Lord, and spend time getting to know Christ himself through prayer. This is to be a daily habit and will enable us to grow in him. So church, be encouraged. Let us heed to his will and his way and so that he can lead us to live lives that are well-pleasing unto the Lord. To God be the glory. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for the giftings and the grace that you've placed upon our lives, Lord God. 
I thank you that when we first received you, Lord God, it was no longer us that live, Lord God, but it's you that's living in us now, Lord. So I thank you, Lord, for love. I thank you for comfort. I thank you for affection. I thank you for compassion, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that we can be like-minded, my Lord and my Savior, not seeking our own way and our will, but seeking yours, Father, in the name of Jesus. So we can be your hands and feet, giving love, to one another, Lord God, because you say people will know that you are my disciples by how you show love one to another. So I pray, Lord God, that you may fill us with your spirit that enables us to do your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray and give you glory. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Let's turn to our feet and open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in the Word of God. Amen. John, chapter 1, in the Word of God. And when you're there, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. What morning? That is, are you bringing people to Jesus? Amen. Do you remember the first time that somebody shared the word of God with you? Weren't you grateful for that person reaching out and sharing God's word? You might have been saved by perhaps... Somebody um, sharing the word with you. You might have been saved by uh, perhaps watching a television program, a preacher preaching. Maybe Billy Graham shared the word of God and you accepted Jesus. But somebody in your life was instrumental to bring you to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? And how many you know we want to do the same thing with others? John chapter 1, reading verse 35 down to verse 42 in the word of God. The Bible says, The following day, John was again standing with, his two, with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and then declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Then John's two disciples turned and followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place, and they stayed there the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who had heard what John said and then followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And look at verse 42. Then Andrew brought, somebody say brought, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, You are Simon, the son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise your mighty name for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for Andrew, Lord God, who was a disciple of John the Baptist, then became a disciple of you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he considered his brother first, Peter, Simon Peter, to bring him to you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we learn from these scriptures to bring people to you. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you just have your perfect way and will. I know, Lord, we have problems in our lives as naturally as Christians do. And Lord God, sometimes the enemy wants us to just focus on ourselves and not reach out to this lost and dying world. But Lord, you have raised up the church of the living God in order to share your word and the good news with other people. I pray, Lord, that we'd open up our eyes this morning, our hearts, and to look around. Perhaps somebody in our own family is not saved for us to be instrumental in bringing them to you, Lord. I pray that we'd share your word at work with our coworkers, with even the people at Market Basket and the cashiers, or perhaps the baggers, or people at Walmart, or people at the gas station or the bank teller. Lord, we're in different places all week doing our different errands. But Lord, help us to look at people that don't know Jesus and help us to have compassion for them, to share your word with them. We thank you for that, Father. Help us to bring people to church, Lord God, to worship you, to praise you, to hear your word, to be discipled. And Lord, we thank you. We magnify your name this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. As I was praying in my office, and it's funny because a couple of you have already said a few things indicating bringing people to church. And how many know it's our responsibility to encourage folks to come? Amen. We have to say, Lord, have your way and will in my heart and in my life. Amen. This is a message God put on my heart <clears throat> to preach today to ask each one of us that question. How is your personal witness going, to, going in your everyday life? Amen. Somebody say personal witness. 
Now, how many of you know we witness through sharing the Word of God with our mouth with other people, sharing the good news of the gospel, but we also witness through our everyday life that people can see more of Jesus in us than us, amen? And that should be our prayer. You know, John the Baptist said, he says, I must decrease when Je while Jesus must increase, amen? We have to say, Lord, I, Craig must decrease as Jesus increases in my life, amen? Somebody say glory to God. You know, we have a responsibility. How many know that we've got to go ahead and be mission-minded? We've got to say, Lord, I want to be mission-minded. I want to share your word with people. Some Christians have told me, you know, Pastor, I want to go to uh, this country and share the word. I want to go to that country and share the word of God. I want to be a missionary. And that's a great desire. It really is. But how many know that the Lord is telling us if your next-door neighbor doesn't know Jesus, that right there is your mission field. Your mission field is at your workplace. Your mission field is at your own home when people don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. How many of you know we've got to say, Lord, I want to share your word with people. I want to give them the good news. Amen? How many of you know that fear is not, is not, God doesn't want us to fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and of a sound mind. Sometimes many believers say, well, I want to share the word with somebody, with one of my coworkers, but I'm just afraid of rejection. What if they make fun of me or whatever the case is? But how many know that God has not given us that spirit of fear? We're simply the postman delivering the message. Now, whether they receive it or not is, is up to them. Amen? If the postman comes to my mailbox and he gives me a check for $1,000 or whatever it might be, and, and, and I'm excited about it, praise God. If the postman comes to my mailbox and gives me a bill for $1,000, I can't get mad at him. He's simply just delivering the message. How many of you and I have the best message in the entire universe? The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to be saved, how to have eternal life with Christ, how to go to heaven once we die, amen? How many of you know we can't keep that the best kept secret? We've got to say, Lord, I want to share your word with people, and whether they receive Jesus or not, I still have the responsibility to share your word. I have the responsibility to invite people to church. I have the responsibility to go ahead and to be used of you, Lord God. Amen? You know, the Lord is not going to use angels to share his word. He's going to use you and me. Aren't you grateful for that person who led you to Jesus? They weren't too timid to tell you about Jesus. They stepped up to the plate and they told you the gospel message, amen? Isn't that an awesome thing? And how many of you know we need to go ahead and to share God's word with people? Now, I, you know, I just want to encourage you now. You know, um, how many of you know that we are our brother's keeper? As you look around and see people that haven't been in church for a while, how many of you know we've got to reach out to them and try to, try to encourage them to come back to the house of God? Sometimes people that haven't been in church for a while feel almost alienated. They, they kind of feel like, well, I, I feel kind of awkward if I went back to church. What would they think of me and so forth? But how many of you know we've got to reach out as, as the church and reach out to these people and encourage them to come back and say, brother, sister, it's okay. We love you. We want you to come back to worship. There's nothing wrong with you. We're not going to start asking you questions, so where were you? How come you didn't attend? We're not like that. We simply want to see you, you come back to church and grow and be discipled and go ahead and, and, and be part of the kingdom of God and part of the church family once again. The local church has been downplayed so much with all the media that we have today. You know, some people, they might watch a preacher that they like on television, on Daystar Christian Network or, or, or whatever, uh, TBN or whatever the case is. But how many you know the local church is extremely important? We all need one another. We all need to attend church on a regular basis. We all need to be used of the, uh, of the Lord in the, ki in the kingdom of God. Amen? How many of the local church is real, real, real important? Somebody say, our church is important. Amen. Aren't you happy to be a part of Changing Lives Christian Church? Amen? And, I, you know, I was asking my, I was praying earlier, and I said, Lord, how are we changing lives? You know, we can't be just so absorbed within self that, well, I want to I get my problems solved, and then maybe if I have time, I'll share the word. We've got to go ahead and share the word irregardless of our problems. And let me give you a little a wisdom key. Brother John likes preaching about wisdom keys. When you're having your own personal problems in your life and you reach out and you share the word of God with people irregardless of your problems, the Lord comes and he takes care of your problem because you are standing up as an ambassador and citizen of heaven and sharing the word of God with somebody else. You see, God will help you when you're going ahead and reaching out and helping others. 
Whatever you do for others in the name of Jesus, God will do for you. Whatever you sow, you what? Reap. How many of you know we want to go ahead and sow love? We want to sow the gospel. We want to share God's word. We want to tell people about Jesus. How many of you know hell is a very terrible place? You don't want to wish your worst enemy to go to hell. It's a place of remembrance. It's a place of remembering the times you could have received Jesus and you rejected him while you lived on the earth. It's a place where the worm dieth not. It's, it's a place where, where, where there's torment, there's suffering, where people are gnashing their teeth. It's an eternal place. It doesn't just stop one day. How I many you know we got to know and understand, amen, the devil, the, 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 the hell was created for the devil and his angels. It was never created or intended for mankind. But mankind chose to sin. And that's as a result of that, they send themselves there by rejecting the supreme gift, and that is Jesus Christ coming to this earth and dying on the cross and having a free gift and saying, you can receive me as Lord and Savior. You can put your faith, your hope, your trust in me, and you can have that personal relationship, and I will save you. Amen? How many of church, we, we have that responsibility? I want you to think right now just for a moment. Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus? Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior? How many of you know we've got to reach out and touch that person? You've got to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to share your word with that person, whether they receive Christ or not. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says that Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, God gave the increase. You've got to play, pray for Apollos's. What I mean by that is, let's say you're Paul, you share the word of God with somebody. They don't receive Jesus. But then you pray, Lord, sow other Christians into that person's life, that Apollos is, so to speak, that they can also share your word and that that person can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. A prophet is not without honor except in his, in his uh, other countries and so forth. Jesus said, what was he saying? Many times in Jesus' hometown, nobody believed in him. When Jesus did tremendous miracles, it wasn't in his own town. Because somebody, you know, people looked at him and said, I know who you are. You're Jesus. You're a carpenter. You're Joseph's and Mary's son. I know who you are. What do you mean you're the son of God? I don't believe that. I mean, my kid, I grew up with you in the temple. We went to school together. You're saying now you're God? You see, sometimes it's the same in our own households. Sometimes maybe your kids are, or maybe your mother, maybe your father, they won't receive Jesus because they're so familiar. They know who you are. But when you start praying and say, Lord, send other people that they will look up to and respect, that will share your word with them, now they're receptive and they hear Jesus and they receive him. So how many of you know you can't take the Bible and beat people over the head with it and make them receive Jesus? In fact, that's pushing them away. But how many of you know we can pray for them, we can share the word of God with them, and we can pray other people are sown into their lives to share God's word with them, Amen. You know, we need to be like Andrew. I love Andrew. You know, he was one of the top ten Christians in the Bible. He has been called the first missionary because he brought his brother Simon Peter to Jesus. You ever hear of Andrew Clubs? In Andrew Club? There are some of those in, in the United States, and they have been in existence for many years. As soon as Andrew got saved, he had to bring someone to Jesus. He began with his own family. With the reality of heaven, hell, and eternity hits you, when that hits you, you have to tell somebody. You can't keep it to yourself. Amen? You know, how many of you know, praise God, when somebody, you know, if somebody won the lottery, they get, a, you know, oh, I just won, I just won five million dollars. Remember one of those Powerball lotteries recently? Somebody won, I thought, what was it, 49 million dollars or whatever it was? You know, they, oh, wow, look at this, look at this, I gotta tell somebody, I just won the Powerball. You know, how many you know they look at that as good news, but how many know we've got better news than that? We've got eternal life. We know the one who can get us to heaven, and that is Jesus. You see, it's not Buddha that's going to get you to heaven. It's not Muhammad that's going to get you to heaven. It's not Allah that's going to get you to heaven. It's only Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. We can't think, well, that's not fair. You know, other religions believe in different things. We're all eventually going to get there. No, we're not eventually going to get there unless we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no way we're going to get to heaven any other way. Jesus said the thief comes and jumps over the wall. But how many of you know that we have to say, okay, Lord, I'm going through the door. You're the only door that I can get to heaven through. I want to receive you as my personal Lord and Savior and as a, have a personal relationship with you. Amen? 
And in that relationship, how I many you know you've got to pray? You've got to keep God focused. You've got to keep on focusing on his word every day. You've got to keep on feeding on his word. Listen to worship music. Have Christian fellowship. Come to your local church on a regular basis. Amen? How I many you know we have responsibilities as believers? Jesus didn't save us so we can just be saved ourselves and be selfish and not tell people. How I many you know we've got the greatest message in the entire world and universe to share with people? And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? There's five points I want to talk about this morning. And one is this. To go and tell somebody requires a personal faith. Amen? To go and tell somebody about Jesus requires a personal faith. Andrew heard John speak. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, how many of you know John the Baptist knew his place? He knew he was the forerunner of Christ. John didn't try to overrule Christ. He saw Jesus coming on the scene, and now he said, I must decrease while Jesus must increase. So he said, behold, the Lamb of God. J John pointed over to Christ. This is one of the first lessons in soul winning, amen? How many of you know we've got to point people to Jesus? That's why I've always said from this pulpit for 23 years now as a pastor, I've always said, don't ever lift up Pastor Craig, you lift up Jesus Christ. But respect me for my position and what I do. But how many know we worship God? Amen? We worship the Lord. We've got to say, Lord, have your way and will in my heart and in my life. Amen? We must point people to Jesus, not ourselves. See, whenever we draw attention to ourselves, that's not, that's not of God. We want to draw people to Jesus. Amen? We want to say, you know, Jesus is the answer. If somebody comes up here and they're sick and I lay hands on them, anoint them with oil and pray for them and they get healed, it's not Pastor Craig that healed them. It's Jesus who healed them. Because by his stripes, we are healed. Amen? Praise God. Andrew spent some time with Jesus, the Bible says. Andrew followed Jesus. Now, John, you know, John the Baptist didn't get all upset and say, what do you mean? You're my disciple. You're not his. What are you following him for? You see, John the Baptist knew his position. He knew that his disciples eventually were going to go follow Jesus. Amen? So Andrew followed Jesus. Andrew received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen? Praise God. The second point I want to make in today's message is to go and tell somebody requires direction and dedication. Somebody say direction and dedication. Now, Andrew brought his own brother to Jesus. Without argument, without hesitation, he told Peter that he had found the Christ. So the Bible says, and he brought him to Jesus. How many times do we, you know, ladies, whenever you have a, a baby, um, you know, let's say you're going to Lawrence General Hospital and, you know, you, and time is due and you, you go full term nine months and you go in a delivery room and you have a baby. Well, you nurture that baby. You don't have the baby and then leave it in the hospital and go home and say, my job is done. Somebody say, praise the Lord. The baby comes home with you. You nurture the baby. You bring the baby up. You teach the baby and so forth. It becomes then a toddler and so forth and grows. Isn't that right? How many times have we shared the word of God with people and they've accepted Jesus, but yet, okay, my job's done, see you later, and we don't take them under our wing and try to disciple them. Isn't that right? Amen? We've got to go ahead and disciple people. How many know we're going to invite people to church? You know, when somebody receives Jesus, yes, they're excited about it, but they have to be continually taught the word of God. They've got, to, they've got to know the things of God because the enemy will try to come and try to pull them away from the Lord. And how many you know we've got, we got to be a source of encouragement to people, to tell them to come to church, amen, to come to Bible study, to come to prayer meeting, to, you know, to, to share the word with them. If they have questions about the Bible, for them to ask you so you can answer them what, what the Bible means and what, what the Bible is talking about, amen? It's very, very, very important, amen? Because I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians have lost sight of sharing God's word. Sometimes they might think, well, they're not going to accept Jesus anyway. I won't even bother trying. But how many you know it's not, about, it's not about Apollos? It's not about Paul. It's all about God giving the increase. Because when we share God's word, and somebody receives Jesus, a miracle has just taken place in their heart. A miracle has taken place in their heart. Amen? Praise be to God. Now, to, who told Andrew to go after his brother? He was saved, and with the joy of the Lord in his heart, he went to Peter and brought him to Jesus. Amen. Praise God. I want you to look at that because I want you to interpret that bringing people to Jesus as bringing people, after they receive Christ, to bring them to church. Amen. How many know they've got to be fed God's word? You've got to know and understand how many pews are here that we can fill up. Isn't that right? Amen. 
you know, we cannot have the mentality S4 and no more. And I don't believe we do, honestly. I believe we want to grow. Amen? Praise God. We want to say, Lord, have your own way in changing lives, Christian church. Have your way in this local church. Let me be an instrument in bringing people to know you as Lord and Savior. In John chapter 6, a great multitude was following Jesus. He asked Philip about buying bread. Jesus knew what he would do, but he was questioning his disciples for a reason. In the midst of his questioning, the Bible says in John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Now, Andrew knew that this would not feed the crowd, but his faith in Christ led him to believe that the Lord would do something about it. How many know that God takes little and he makes much? When we pray, how many know God takes that little and he makes very much? When we ask him, Lord, give me increase, he will give you increase. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he, he, Jesus fed two occasions. He fed many, many men. And on the occasion of the 5,000 men, besides children and, 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 and women that he fed, how many know that they only started off with just a little bit, maybe seven loaves of bread and a couple of fish? But Jesus can multiply. Jesus is the one who's a multiplier, amen? How many know we want him to multiply souls? We want to see more souls come to know him as Lord and Savior, amen? Andrew knew that this would not feed the crowd, but his faith in the Lord, again, said, Lord, we've got this. At least he acknowledged it. He didn't say, well, that, and, and just his thoughts, ah, that's not going to work. Lord, we do have a kid who's got this little lunch that he brought, but, I mean, how, what good is that going to do? And then he brings that what he had to Jesus, and Jesus prays and he multiplies all of it. Oh, praise God. Isn't that good news, church? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Andrew knew that. Now, thirdly, to go and tell somebody is a requirement. Somebody say a requirement. The Great Commission was given by Jesus to all believers, found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Church, we have a job to do here at Changing Lives Christian Church. Amen? We must bring people into this church and make disciples. Somebody say, make disciples. Amen? It's very, very important. Amen? And we, you know, and how many know it's, it's so true that, you know, we, we got to go ahead and be used of Jesus. We got to go ahead and be instrumental. Our church on 446 Prospect Street, I was just going there the other night, and I went to China Star and bought myself some Chinese food. How do you know China Style's got some good food? Amen. Praise God. Well, that was a restaurant right next door to 446 Prospect Street. How, much, how many of us remember China Style, right? It's, well, it's still there, and it's still in business. But now, our church is still there, but it's still vacant. It, the walls are still just totally, you know, bare. Uh, we had a fire there, and it burned everything and so forth. And we were praying and said, Lord, is this the end? I mean, are we going to continue in the ministry? What's going to happen? And four years later, look where we are now. Now, God did not go ahead and make a miracle happen for us to attain this, this particular beautiful facility, this building, with just a very small congregation. He has an assignment for you and me. He wants somebody sitting next to you next Sunday, somebody that you brought in. He wants somebody to receive him as Lord and Savior. He wants somebody to go ahead and share his word with other people and bring them in as well. Amen? Now, I just want to encourage all of you that, you know, if you're unaware, we have membership classes here. And the membership classes, you go through about five classes with me, amen, and then you, you, we, we give you an exam concerning what you've learned in those classes. From that point, we also have a spiritual gifts test we give you. And you take that exam, and by the, by the time you're done, you know where your gifts are, are and what, or how you can be used in the ministry. How many know there's many, many different gifts that God has given and we could be a source of sharing his word and using those gifts to the best of our ability. Not all are pastors, not all are evangelists, and not all are prophets, not all are... You know, how many know he has different, different gifts that he gives? And when we all work together as a body, he blesses those gifts. How can the eye say to the ear, I have no need of you? We all need one another. Because I'll tell you what, if only my eyes said, I'm, I'm going to rule and reign in Craig's uh, life, and, and all of a sudden I'm going to ignore the ears, well, if my eyes were walking down the street and there was a Mack truck behind me, went out of control, and starts beep, beeping his horn, my eyes don't see it, my ears pick up on it, but my eyes rejected the ears, my whole body's going down. 
So therefore, we're all needed in this church. Isn't that right? Amen? Somebody say, I'm needed here. Amen. That's very, very important. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Mark 16, 15 goes on to say, And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Say to yourself, well, Pastor, what are we doing to get the Word of God out? Well, obviously, we're on community television, eight different community stations. We understand that. We're preaching the gospel every single week in the entire Merrimack Valley on some station. Amen. And, and we're on eight different ones. And sometimes when you flip it on your TV, you might see Changing Lives Christian Church come up. We have a YouTube channel with all of our services on it. Every single week, we post all the services, amen, one at a time on, um, on the different social medias. Twitter, uh, on, on um, uh, Facebook, and so forth. It goes on Google. It goes on many different areas so people can see and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And while that's great, we've got to do more. Our personal witness is the most important. Do you know that there was a survey taken? Through community television, a very low percentage of people were actually saved. But through personal witnessing, in other words, somebody that you know already have some kind of a relationship with, whether it's a coworker, family member, aunt, an uncle, mother, father, whoever it might be, and you bring people into the church, that's how churches grow. 75% of church growth is done that way. As we're studying in the Bible, what happened? Andrew, the first thing he did, he went and got his brother Peter and says, hey, Peter, I have found the Messiah. Come on. I'm bringing, him to, I'm bringing you to him. Isn't that awesome? And look how Peter was used. He was used tremendously of the Lord. Amen? Yeah, Peter blew it. He blew it big, big, big time. He denied the Lord three times. But how many you know that wasn't the end for him? Every time, sometimes when we blow it and I walk with the Lord, we got to get up again and say, Lord, please forgive me and help me now to do that again and keep on moving forward. Because let me tell you this, nobody is perfect. Everybody's got their issues, amen? But how many know the devil wants to keep you down, but Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, wants to take you up again and continue to move you forward? Amen. We're not products of our past. How many know the Bible says that old things have passed away? All things become new in the Lord, amen? Praise be to God. You know, the Great Commission has to be combined with the Great Commandments. The Great Commandment is Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that right? Wouldn't our world be a much better place if we loved our neighbor as ourself? Wouldn't it be a much better place if everybody loved Jesus? Amen? Amen? Praise God. We've got to know and understand, church, that we're going to stand before God one day. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12-15 through 15 tells us, Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. Amen? You know, it's talking about the judgment of rewards and so forth. And, and how many know we have to know and understand, you know, if we ask ourselves a question, we're on our deathbed, and the doctor says we have one month to live, are we going to look back at our life and say, I only wish I did more for Jesus? Why was I so tied up in this? Why was I tied up in that career so badly? How come I was doing this and I was overlooking people that I could have shared the word with? How I many you know the Bible says we've got to redeem the time? What does that mean? It means now is the time to reach out and be used of the Lord. We've got to say, Lord, I want to be used of you. If I'm an intercessor, I'm going to pray like never before. If I'm a pastor, I'm going to preach like never before. If I'm a teacher, I'm going to teach like never before. We've got to say, Lord, have your will, perfect way and will in my life and move by your spirit, Lord God. Because let me tell you something, without the spirit of God, we can't do anything. Not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. If God's power is not behind what we do, we're doing it in vain. If we, labor, if we labor without the Lord and the Lord's not in it, it's all in vain. Amen? So we've got to say, Lord, I want you in everything that I do for you. 
I want you to bless and anoint what I do for you, Lord God. When I preach, Lord, let my words, re let my words that Holy Spirit reach people's hearts. It's not about us, it's all about Him. Our, our citizenship is in heaven, the Bible says. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 says we are already seated in heavenly places. Right. You have a seat up in heaven with your name on it. You're already seated up there. But how many of you know it's like, okay, right now you're on the earth. You can reach people with your life right now for Christ. Amen. You see, when everything is all done, the Bible says for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul, what was Paul saying in that scripture? He was saying, for me to live is doing God's work on this earth more than like never before, and to die is gain, I'll be home with the Lord. So when our assignment is done, we'll go home to be with the Lord, that's fine, but what are we doing here now to make a difference in this lost and dying world? Are we reaching out to people? Are we reaching out to individuals, amen? There are people that don't know Jesus that we've got to share God's word with. I asked myself a question as I was praying and preparing this message, and I said, I said, you know, Lord, what makes a good local church? Let's look at some practical things that make a good local church. If I was to pass out paper to all of you and you wrote down some things, what would it be? Well, these are just a few practical things that I wrote down. The first one was to have a clean, neat facility to worship God in. Take a look around. You ever see the bathrooms dirty at Changing Lives Christian Church? Do you ever run out of toilet paper? You see a nice church when you walk in. You walk in the foyer, it smells good because there's scent little things inside the, inside the outlets. You come in church, you see a beautiful sanctuary. You see beautiful people. Amen? So how many of you know we've got a beautiful facility to worship God in? We went from Prospect Street, literally when it was raining out. It was raining out this morning. <laughs> if we were still worshiping on Prospect Street, I would have walked in that church and the floors would have been drenched, soaking wet because the ceilings were leaking, right? And if I went in the back, with a, you know, in the back fellowship hall, I might meet an occasional mouse running by me. <laughs> well, how many you know, praise God, there's no mice here. <laughs> there's no mice droppings here. Amen? It's a beautiful place to worship God in. Isn't that correct? It, God has blessed us. I mean, God is such an awesome God. What's another thing that makes a, a good local church? It's free and easy parking. How I many you know we don't, it's not like Boston, we have to, you know, we have no parking spaces. We have free parking across the street from the church. And it's awesome because we could just come, park, walk across the street. We're in the house of God. Amen. Isn't that great? And we don't even have to plow it in the wintertime. Because <laughs> the mayor said we can use City Hall parking lot anytime we want. We're blessed. If we had our own parking lot, do you know how much money that would require? All the snowstorms we had this past winter, we would be paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for plows to come in and plow us out. That's done for free. Somebody say free is a good thing. <laughs> God, how many you know God doesn't make mistakes? Now, I'm talking about the building, and that's just practical, but how many, how many know the church are people? The you and me. Amen. How many of you know a good church, what makes a good local church, Pastor Craig? It's friendly and loving people. Somebody say, I'm friendly and I am loving. And that's the truth. The main theme, like Sister Wendy was saying, the main theme I've heard all the years in this church as an attribute is there's a lot of love in that church. People care for each other. People pray for each other. Amen? How many of you know when people come in the front door of a visitor, we don't, we don't look at them and go, oh, a visitor's coming in, let's run away. Who are they? We approach them. How many of us ever look for a church and we feel awkward? We walk in and we're expecting people to greet us and all of a sudden we're just standing there like, like you know, looking around. Nobody's coming to see us. Everybody's in their own little cliques. Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> Who cares? How many of you know when a visitor comes in, we got to go to them immediately and welcome them and say thank you for coming? You know, you, you're welcome to come here and show them around the place and so forth, amen, and make them feel at home. That's really, really important, amen? That's an important thing in a church, the fellowship in the church, amen? amen. Praise God. What about anointed worship song service? Now, we know we don't have a band up here. We don't have a guitar player and a drummer and, you know, a bass player and whatever the case is, but how many you know that when we sing those songs through YouTube, those songs are anointed? And I'll tell you what, whether 
it's a cappella, one person leading the worship, or if it's a huge ten people up here, it makes no difference. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is what makes the difference. Amen? You know, a lot of churches today, and it's unfortunate, and I'm not casting judgment, but I'm just an observation, it's a bunch of entertainment. It's a band. Well, let's see if we can tickle the people's ears and have a good song every now and then. It's not about that. It's about worship. One time a person told me, Pastor Craig, why don't we just hire a guitar player? I said, you don't understand what it is to worship God and be a worship leader up here. You hire somebody because they can play the guitar really good, and that person doesn't even know Jesus. It would do a disservice to this church. How many know you've got to know the Lord? You've got to have that calling. You've got to have that anointing. It's very, very important. Amen? Amen. Praise God. What about a good church? Uncompromised preaching and teaching with emphasis on everyday Christian living. You've got a preacher that preaches not only heaven, but he preaches about hell. It's not a prosperity church where let's all t- have a business meeting and talk about money every Sunday. <laughs> Amen? How many know you've got to warn people against going to that horrible place called hell and you've got to tell them about a wonderful place called heaven? And you've got to tell them about the one Jesus Christ who can get you to heaven and having that personal relationship with them. You've got to talk about sin, talk about all these different areas. How many know that sin separates us from God? God does not want us to live a sinful life. He wants us to live a pure and holy life. He wants us to grow in our relationship with Him. Amen? See, a lot of people, they, they go to church and they have a concept of, well, I want to just hear good stuff and I want to feel good when I leave. Well, conviction is a good thing. When the Holy Spirit convicts us through either the preaching of the Word or reading the Word or whatever the case is, how many know that gets us in back where we're supposed to be? Amen. It's very, very important. Amen. Praise God. How many know you want to be a God-pleaser? You want to please the Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor, what else makes a good local church? I wrote down no clicks. Amen. That's right. What is a click? It's a small group of people. Amen. Different small groups of people that... They think they are superior, and they don't let anybody else join them. Um, Cliques were in high school. You remember them. The cliques with all the cool kids. You know, and and cliques with all the, 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 you know, um, just the, the, the... sport kids or whatever, took up sports or whatever the case is, amen? How many of you know the church should be one huge clique, if I can use that term, but a clique that welcomes everybody? <laughs> Praise the Lord, amen. You've got glory, amen? It doesn't... In our church, in the next one I wrote down is a, di- a diverse congregation. What I love about this church from day one, it was not, it was not pegged as, this is an all-white church. Nobody else is welcome. Uh, this is an all Spanish church. Nobody else is welcome. Uh, this is an all. Wh- How many you know we're all diverse? Amen. And that's awesome. We got people from different nations in this church. Praise God. That's a good thing. Amen. When people come in, everybody feels welcome. They're all invited. Amen. That's awesome. There's no prejudice in this church. Let me tell you that right now. Amen. And as long as I'm a pastor, there ain't never going to be. Amen. Amen. We're all equal in God's eyes. We're all special people. It makes no difference what color we are, how much money we make, or where we're from. We're all special in God's eyes. Right now, Brother Paul is in Guatemala. I don't know if Sister Anna knew that, but he's in Guatemala for six days doing missionary work. And that's awesome that he went there, amen? He's all excited about it. Keep on praying for him. I'm sure he'll have a great testimony when he comes back. But how many you know, it's, it's, you know, it's one, you know one of the, um, the, the First Baptist Church was interviewing, or had me on their TV show on, on um on their cable station in Haver Community Station. And as Pastor Harrington, Rick Harrington, was, was, was um, interviewing me, he says, I noticed something awesome about your church. I said, what is that? He, he said, it's so diverse. He said, you got people from different walks of life. you got people from different nations in your church. That's awesome. He said, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do anything. The Holy Spirit did that. Amen? Amen? Because how many know that's a really good thing? Amen? Praise God. Somebody say, I'm special. Amen. Somebody walks in here, and they, they've, got, they've got, you know, um, disabilities concerning, uh, you know, mental disabilities. We don't judge them. Somebody comes in, they don't have a job. We don't judge them. Somebody comes in, they, they have a job. It's, it's not making much money. We don't judge them. Somebody comes in, they have a job making a lot of money. We're not going to judge them. It makes no difference how a person's dressed or what we look like. We're all special in God's eyes. Amen. Amen. And that's so important to remember. Amen. Praise God. 
We have fellowship dinners to promote fellowship the last Sunday of the month like we have after today's service, amen? I think fellowship dinners are a good thing. It has time and opportunity to talk to each other about everyday life and the fellowship, and I believe that's very important, amen? We have, we have dedicated people now to, uh, since Brother Mike passed away, that was his ministry, but now we have other uh, dedicated people, uh, Sister Wendy, Sister Diane, Brother John, taking care of the coffee and the pastry uh, offered before the services. Amen. And that's an awesome ministry. So people come in early, they can sit and chat and have some fellowship. Amen? Praise God. We have prayer at 10.30 in the morning before service starts every Sunday here at the, right, right at the altar. Amen? We have midweek open discussion Bible study, a small group discussion, amen, on Wednesday nights. We have weekly prayer meetings at 7.30 here on Thursday mornings, amen. So how many know that I believe that we're, we're, we're a good church, amen? amen? And I, you know, obviously we want to keep on improving and so forth in these different areas, but how many know that God wants us to grow? Right. We're a great place to be. If people want to be used in ministry here, they can be used in ministry here. They could go through the membership classes and be used in, in some capacity or some ministry. We're all ministers of the gospel. How many know we've all got to be used of the Lord? We've got to say, Lord, have your will, way, have your will, Lord God, in this church. Now, not everybody that's part of this church is able to attend on Sundays. We've got people that are very much part of this church, but they're living, you know, a, a far distance, whereas they can't come, like Sister Nellie, God bless her. She's still very much part of us. Amen. I mean, she prays with us every Thursday morning. You say, how did she get here? We have her on speakerphone. Sister Agnes calls her. So we, she's praying at the prayer service. Amen. Great woman of God has many prayer lines throughout the course of every day of the week. Amen. So that's awesome. And how many of those prayers are important? Amen. We got Sister Dawn who takes care of Brianna. She can't come here as a result of taking care of her, but she's very much part of this ministry. Amen. Amen. You have other people and so forth, amen, that don't necessarily, they can't attend, but they're very much part of this church, amen, and we pray for them and we thank God for them. We've got to continue to lift them up in prayer. Amen. It's God. You know, the Bible tells us in the Word of God in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it says, Then the master said to the servants, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. God wants these pews filled every Sunday. He wants his house filled at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. He wants that, that balcony full. On Sunday morning. Brother Keith up there, the cameraman, he needs some company. Amen. <laughs> Sister Hannah needs some company. All them, you know, Joshua and, and, and Lindsay, so forth. Amen. How many know that we want to see this place grow? But unless we bring people in and all of us work together, that's not going to happen. Amen. We can't put a sign out front on the lawn and say, Changing Lives Christian Church, all welcome, and have flocks of people coming in. It would be nice if that was the case. But how many know you and I have to bring them in and invite them? What's wrong with telling somebody, hey, uh, you know, this coming Sunday, why don't you come to my church at 11 o'clock and experience it? It's awesome. You meet a great group of people, amen? amen? Somebody comes in, they hear the gospel, they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. They, they went to, as a result, when they pass away, they've gone to heaven because of your witness. Amen? amen? Isn't that very important? Amen? Praise God. We've got to say, you know, Webster's Dictionary, the Bible says to urge or compel. What does that mean? It means to urge or force action. Now, you can't force people, but how many know it means to really take that seriously? Compel other unsaved loved ones to receive Jesus, to bring them in to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So the three things in conclusion of this message we need to know. We must know the lostness of men. A lot of times Christians don't want to think about hell, but it's a real place. It's a place where you don't ever want to go. It's a place where you don't want anybody to go. Everybody should have that opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Every man without Christ is lost and undone. The rich, the poor, the high, the low, and the young and the old. You know, money doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. How many of you know we've got to say, Lord, I want to see everybody saved. Amen. That person who makes $200,000 a year needs to be saved, just like the one who makes maybe, uh, maybe $2,000 a year. Amen. We've got to know and understand, amen, praise God, that everybody needs Jesus, amen? amen. Every man without Christ is lost and undone. Uh, they're, they're totally lost, amen? We, mu we must know the power of the Savior. He can save to the uttermost all who will come to him. Thirdly, we must know the willingness of God. 
The Bible says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He's not willing, but it doesn't mean that every person does come to repentance. How many you know, church, you and I got to be used of him? And finally, Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So church, how many you know we've got a very, very, very huge responsibility to share God's word? It's something that we're messengers. We've got to say, Lord, have your way and will. I thank you for that individual that shared the word with me. I thank you, Lord God, that I accepted you, Jesus, but now let me go and bring somebody else to know you as Lord and Savior. There are many people hurting in the world today. There are many people in nursing homes that are hurting. So, you know, people that work in nursing homes tell me this all the time, and I've gone and visited people there. They say that Many times, half the residents in nursing homes, not one person ever, no family member or anybody visits them. They literally wake up in the morning just to exist for another day to go back to bed again and try to forget about life in order to wake up the next day and have nobody in their life. How many know church, we've got to reach out in the power of God and touch people with this word. We've got to say, Lord, have your way and have your will. We want to invite people to this church, amen. We want to go ahead and share God's word. We want to go ahead and be used of him because God is an awesome God, amen. And how many know that he will anoint you with his power to share his word? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet and close in a word of prayer, amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord God, for the message today. I thank you so much for the testimonies. Thank you for our church family. I pray, Lord God, that our church would grow. Have your perfect way and will, Lord God. I pray in Jesus' name that we grow spiritually in our personal relationship with you. I pray that we grow numerically with more folks coming in and joining our church family. Help us to grow financially, Lord, so we can do more for you. Help us, Lord God, to just look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. I pray that we be people of prayer, Lord God, people sharing your word on a regular basis, that we be mission-minded. And Lord, we thank you for that, Father. We just praise you. We magnify your name. We lift up Brother Ernest, who's out of the country for about a month or so. We pray for him, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for Brother Paul in Guatemala, Lord. We just pray that you would bless him, give him safe travels, Lord God, as he comes back after a week or so. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for these things and these people. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you if you like. Hi. I'm Craig Matheson, pastor of Changing Lives Christian Church here in Haverhill, Massachusetts. I hope you're having a fantastic day, and I just want to say right up front, thank you so much for tuning in and watching our church services today. I want to share a quick scripture, a Bible scripture, in, found in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And these are the words of Jesus. And it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is called what we refer to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to share God's word, the good news of salvation, with everybody that we know. And that's one of the reasons we're on TV here at in Haverhill, Massachusetts, from our church, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with many folks like yourself. Now, I just want to share a little bit about our church, about our church services specifically, what we do during the week, what our Sunday morning service is all about, and so forth. Many people have asked me, well, Pastor, how long is your church service? What happens during your church service? We see you preaching on TV, but it's an hour long in totality, but how long is the church service in itself? Well, let me, let me get into some details. First of all, every Sunday morning, what we do is we have we start at 11 o'clock. Our church service time on Sunday morning is at 11 o'clock in the morning. And the first thing we do in our church service is we open up in a word of prayer. Prayer is very important. After that, we sing one worship song. And it's contemporary Christian worship music is what we use in our church. And we do some hymns sometimes. Now, as we sing the songs, we have two big screen TVs that are in the front of our congregation and in the front of our altar rather and those screens have all the words of the lyrics of the songs on them so that way anybody at all can come in and follow along even if they're here for the first time after that first song is done we have a volunteer from our church one of our members come up and do an opening scripture reading and prayer verse 
After that happens, we go ahead and we do three more worship songs, contemporary Christian uh, music, or some hymns mixed in. From that point on, what we do is we, we, come, we take up an offering, uh, tithes and offerings, then we have testimony time in our church. That is, the floor is opened up to the sanctuary, to the congregation, meaning that, you know, anybody can raise a hand and say, Pastor, I'd like to give a testimony. And then anybody can give, uh, you know, a testimony if they, if they prefer to. They don't have to, but they can if they want to. After that, I come up front to the pulpit and I start preaching the Word of God. I preach for about 40 to 45 minutes in that basic area, as if you view me on TV, you see how long, basically, I preach for 40, 45 minutes. Now, during the preaching, or before the preaching starts, we have children's church, which is awesome. We have a room dedicated to children's church upstairs here in the church, and we have a couple of very dedicated teachers who, who teach children's church. So in other words, the time that I get up to preach, your children will be dismissed, and they can go to children's church and be taught the word of God from our children's church teachers. Or, if you prefer, you can allow them to stay with you here in the sanctuary. That's up to you. You're the parent. Totally up to you. But we do have that available. After I'm done preaching, uh, we close the service, but we have an informal altar call. What I mean by informal is, I stay up front for a few minutes, and what happens is if anybody comes up for individual prayer, I'm here to pray for you individually, depending on whatever prayer need that you may have. After that happens, what we do is we have some donuts and coffee here at the church after every service so people can hang out here for a little while and have some fellowship and talk. And incidentally, the church is open at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning. 9 o'clock, we open early so that people can come in and they can spend some time in the sanctuary in prayer before the service starts. At 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, we have donuts and coffee that is prepared for anybody at all that wants to come in and have some fellowship in our fellowship hall and just have a few donuts and coffee and chat a little bit before the service. So that is, that is kind of what happens here on Sunday morning. The last Sunday of every month, we have a fellowship dinner. That is, we ask everybody in the congregation, or those who can, to bring a covered dish. And we have kind of a potluck type lunch. And what we do is after the Sunday morning service ends, the last Sunday of each month, what we do is we have in our fellowship hall here in the church, we have, um, you know, we eat a nice dinner together and we have some fellowship in the fellowship hall as well. So it's a real blessing. Also, midweek service, we have Wednesday night Bible studies here at the church, which are awesome. We go through the Bible verse by verse. And what we do is an open discussion Bible study, so anybody at all can ask questions, and we go verse by verse in the Bible. It's an informal um, Bible study. It's not like a real formal thing. Anybody, again, anybody can ask a question or whatever the case is or, or, or share their input on whatever we're studying in the Bible. Um, and we basically sit around a table, like a big, big oval conference table um, with a bunch of desk chairs and so forth. Right now, we're small uh, in our Bible studies group, but we're gonna, we intend to be growing, so eventually we'll outgrow that room and we'll be in here in the sanctuary, which is okay. But it's an informal time where we can ask questions about the Bible, we teach the Word of God verse by verse, and it's really awesome to be here in Bible study. So that's Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Thursday morning, bright and early, 7.30 in the morning, we have prayer meeting here at the church. If you work third shift, or if you work maybe in a nursing home or something, and you're like, wow, I'd love to go to a prayer meeting right after work because I get out of work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I work the 11 to 7 shift. Perfect opportunity for you to come here at Changing Lives Christian Church and join us in prayer. We're here at 7.30 in the morning, every Thursday morning, and we come in the sanctuary and we pray to the Lord. If you have a prayer request, by all means, Please email us your prayer request. The email address is there at the bottom of the screen. We will most definitely lift up your prayer request before the Lord. I just felt like I needed to share a little bit of what happens in our church services and what goes on. And incidentally, uh, you know, I'm the pastor of the church. I'm no better than anybody else, even though I have the title pastor or anything like that. So if you would like to email me or give me a call, and say, Pastor Craig, I'm interested in attending your church. I want to eventually become a member, but I have a few more questions. Uh, what could, you know, could I set up an appointment with you to ask you some questions? I'm more than willing, more than willing. Just email me or give me a call and we'll most definitely set up a time. You can come in my office here and you, we can sit down and chat. You can ask me as many questions as you want and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. I hope that you have a fantastic day today. Thank you for tuning in once again to see us here 
a church service at Changing Lives Christian Church. And may God bless you.